Hello and welcome to this video on the effect of the cap binding protein on capped mRNA translation. My name is Thomas Garten and this video is created for the MCDB 427 class which is molecular biology at the University of Michigan. For those of you with access to it, we will be using Molecular Biology, the 5th edition by Robert F. Weaver for the figures in this video. Before we delve into the cap cap binding protein interactions, we should do a quick recap of what the cap actually is. So here I've sketched out a eukaryotic mRNA molecule, uh, and I've pointed out some important features here. So up at the very front, so this is the 5' end, here is the M7G cap. So this is what we're really interested in for this presentation. Right after that we've got our 5' prime untranslated region and our start codon. So this is the start of our translated region. Start codon. After that we have our coding region that will be translated into the protein of interest. And then our stop codon. Finally at our 3' prime end we've got our poly A tail. So this M7G cap, this is what we're really interested in. Here's a molecular view of what that looks like. You can see down here in the bottom right, this says mRNA. So down here, that's the rest of the genes. So that's translating this way. So five primes up here, three prime is down here. So the very, the very penultimate nucleotide has three phosphates linked onto it, and then a sort of a backwards guanine. So backwards G nucleotide, as is evidenced by this G in the M7G name. This guanine has at its seventh position appear a methyl group, the CH3. So the methyl group, that's the M, at the seventh position. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, and then this is number seven. So that's why we have a methyl at the seventh group, and this is a guanine residue, hence M7G. Previous studies had found that this cap was important in translation efficiency. If you remove this cap from an mRNA molecule, that mRNA molecule would not be able to be translated with nearly the efficiency it would if it did have the cap. So for this to be the case, we know that something must be interacting with this cap, leading to this uh, efficiency. Sure enough, in 1978, Merrick et al. identified the cap binding protein. They did this by performing a cross-linking experiment that I won't go into much detail about here, but in summary they identified a small 24 kilodalton protein that did bind specifically to this M7G cap at the 5' prime end of the mRNA, and not to any other guanines present in solution. This then raised the final question, does this cap binding protein, which was later called EIF4E, or eukaryotic initiation factor 4E, does this protein actually impact the efficiency of translation at all, or is this a random finding? The researchers that were able to test this were Sonnenberg et al, and they did this in 1980. So what they did is they first had to purify and isolate our cap binding protein. So they did this by running an M7 GDP Cepheros column, that's this thing, to which they added initiation factors, just a whole host of them. How did they get these initiation factors in the first place? Well, it turns out that because initiation factors and ribosomes are both part of the initiation complex of translation, if you can find yourself some ribosomes, pretty easy task, they will most likely be bound to initiation factors. But not so well that if you add in a salt wash, so if you wash this ribosome initiation factor complex with a salty solution, it'll end up dissociating this complex. Then you can centrifuge the solution. The ribosomes are super heavy, so they'll end up at the bottom, and your initiation factors will end up floating around in solution. So then the experimenters just took that, took the initiation factors, the general initiation factors, they added it to this, co this column. So this column, uh, as I just mentioned, was a, is an M7 GDP Cepheros column. So it's sort of a, an affinity column where they have M7 GDP on these little beads and the initiation factors will just wash past them. Now, we do know that the cap binding protein will in fact associate to this. So we're going to end up with the cap binding protein, E, IF4E stuck to the column. 
Now, what the experimenters do is then they keep washing and washing with higher and higher salt concentrations until in the later fractions, they have a high enough salt concentration that we can wash our EIF for E off of the column. So in the end, you're going to end up with isolated EIF for E in your fraction in this last vial here. Now, what we can do is we can either add it or not add this cat binding protein to heal us cell-free extracts. So this basically is if you took uh, the HeLa cancerous cells or immortal cells and you took their contents and you just put them in a, in a test tube or some other reaction container. And what we can now do is we can add to this either one of two kinds of RNAs, either encephalomyocarditis RNA or Synbis RNA. And now these are viral RNAs where Synbis RNA does have a cap. So Synbis RNA is capped. But encephalomyocarditis RNA lacks the cap or it's uncapped. Okay, so we either are adding or not adding our capping protein into a solution that contains ribosomes uh, as well as either capped or uncapped RNA. How are we going to visualize this in the end? The authors incubated all of this in a solution containing 35S methionine, so radio labeled methionine. So this is going to get incorporated into any proteins that are made at the end of the day by these cell-free extracts. So any proteins that are made due to these RNA transcripts. So to recap, the experimental paradigm was that they had ribosomes and initiation factors in the HeLa extract, to which they added either capped, so yes capped, or uncapped RNAs. So this is the RNA. And then they added either yes cap binding protein, or they did not add the cap binding protein to either of these two conditions. So in the end, we get four different conditions. Uh, yes, yes to cap uh, and cap binding protein. Yes, no, no, yes, and no, no. And these four conditions are highlighted here on this figure on the right. So yes, cap RNA and yes, cap binding protein. That is highlighted here by this blue line right here. So yes, cap binding protein and yes, cap mRNA. The yes to RNA and no to cap binding protein. That's this red line right here. Then these other two conditions are similarly uh, no capped RNA and cap binding protein, yes. That's this blue line. And then the last condition here is the red line. So what do these results actually show? Okay, so let's take a closer look here at this figure. Uh, you'll see here on the y-axis, this is the 35S methionine incorporated. So this is our radio labeled methionine residues uh, that are going to be incorporated into the protein. So this is a marker for the amount of translation that's occurring. The higher this number here, the more methionine is being incorporated and thus the more translation is occurring. On the x-axis, we just have the time that we're going to let this translation occur. So this is just over time how much translation is occurring. And we can see that even without the cap binding protein, this line here demonstrates that the addition of the cap binding protein is not essential for the translation of these capped mRNAs in this in vitro assay. However, if we compare these two lines, you'll see that when we do add in a cap binding protein, this translation increases drastically. In other words, the cap binding protein, otherwise known as EIF, for E, it really does affect the translation efficiency when capped mRNA is present. Now, if we look at when we have uncapped mRNA, we still see that we actually are getting translation of mRNA. And in fact, if you look closely, you'll see that these numbers, 50, 100, 150, those are massive compared to these. So we are getting a very high translation level. 
This may be due to the kind of mRNA we were using, however. If you recall, uh, we used two different types of mRNAs, encephalomyocarditis and synbis. And so this might just be due to one mRNA being translated at a much higher rate than another one. What's really important to note, however, is that there really is no difference between the amount of translation occurring when we have the cap binding protein and when we don't have the cap binding protein. So we can say that this cap binding protein, EIF for E, really does not affect the translation efficiency of uncapped mRNA when you don't have capped mRNA present. The authors also performed this experiment uh, where instead of looking at the time on the x-axis, they looked at the amount of RNA present. So they adjusted the amount of RNA present between 0 and 1 micrograms for the capped mRNA condition and 0 and 2 micrograms in the uncapped mRNA condition. And what they've found is that in this in vitro translation assay, there was some amount of translation of the mRNAs in the absence of cap binding protein. But in the presence of this EIF4E, we do see an, an increase in the amount of translation. Similarly, when we look at the uncapped mRNA condition, you can see that once again, we have very high levels of translation, uh, but they're not different, right? Adding in the cap binding protein doesn't really change how much uncapped mRNA is being translated. As would be expected, uh, you can see that as we increase the amount of RNA we've added, we are increasing the amount of uh, protein that's being translated in a relatively linear fashion in both of these cases. In conclusion, this study identified that the cap binding protein, later determined to be this EIF4E, is actually able to influence translation efficiency of these M7G capped mRNAs, but it does not affect the translation efficiency of uncapped mRNAs. Future studies determined that EIF4E actually helps to stabilize these other initiation factors you can see up here, and the 40S ribosomal subunit, in addition to binding the 5' cap, which facilitates the initiation of translation. Thank you very much, and go blue!